Good morning, church, and God bless you this morning. How many of you are like me and you give God thanks that you don't have to go to school anymore? Amen. On this graduation Sunday, I want to welcome you, and I'm so excited to get to share uh, several things with you today. Uh, One, we get to share the word together, and we have a great uh, time of food and fellowship prepared after the service. We hope everybody can stick around for our time of, uh, of just hanging out and, and getting to eat, break bread together. We've got plenty for everybody, as Pastor What's-His-Name said. And uh, we would just, even if you didn't bring anything and you just now are hearing about it, please know uh, that you're invited and we'll meet together in the Fellowship Hall uh, right after service. Uh, one thing that I wanted to do before we do anything else is to acknowledge and honor those that are graduating. You'll see their names on the screen, and I want to ask our, those that are graduating today, if you would, to join me quickly, and my wife, Victoria. She's not graduating. I just need her help, but would, you, would those graduating join me on the stage, and would y'all make them welcome with a round of applause? Gabriel and Judy and Alicia. God bless y'all. Oh, my mic is still. Oh, and Peyton. I didn't realize she was a senior as well. We've got four, so I'll have to get you one of these later. Oh, five. Are you graduating too? Good grief. I know. Y'all got to let me know these things. Well, these that are graduating, the three of you that I know, I have this for, and I'll get it for the rest of you as well. Uh, Those that are stepping out in this new venture, this new uh, journey, I just wanted to commend you. And and also, uh, you may want to help me. I'm getting a lot of ring on this mic, brother. I wanted to to let you know as well that... uh, This is just kind of the beginning of your journey. I know poor Alicia's probably like, good Lord, are you kidding me? She's done so much uh, graduating from college. Uh, But these graduating from high school and college, I wanted to ask the church to pray a special prayer over them, uh, just a blessing for their future. I want Victoria to join me in prayer. Would you just stretch your hands this way, and could we pray for these that are stepping into this new journey? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks uh, for these young people, God, just for the, the dedication that they've put in for the effort that they've put forth. And Father, I pray that you would uh, guide and direct their steps. As your word says, if they will trust not in their own understanding, but in all their ways acknowledge you, uh, you'll guide and direct them. And Father, I pray that over them. I pray blessings. You've got great plans for them, uh, plans of a hope and a future to prosper them and not to harm them, God. And we give you praise and give you thanks in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Would you give them another round of applause? And for those on the screen... There's Gabe and Alicia, and don't worry, I will get one for Constance and for Peyton as well, and you guys can be seated. Thank y'all so much. Yeah, give them a round of applause. Now, some of them have tables set up and uh, back in the fellowship hall, and, and those that don't, uh, we also have Constance Shellnut and Peyton Vickers that are graduating, Alicia graduating from college. Uh, Gabriel and Judy and all these others graduating from high school. Uh, If you want to give them a card, want to give them a a gift of encouragement, by gift I mean cash, uh, I'm sure that they would be uh, blessed by that and and would love to to get to uh, have you celebrate them. We do have uh, food and stuff prepared afterwards as well, so I'm going to try to not take too much time this morning, but I want to talk to you about something very near and dear to my heart. Uh, Today we're going to talk about understanding our spiritual gifts, understanding the gifts that God gives us. And we've read this scripture uh, each, each week through this series about the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 19, verses 1 and 2, which says, While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, No, we have not even heard there is a Holy Spirit. Would you pray for me again and pray with me that God would just bless this time as we look to his word together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much, God, for uh, the gifts that you have given us uh, from salvation. And and then you go beyond that through the the precious gift of, of the Holy Spirit, our comforter, our friend. Father, I pray you bring understanding. You bring just new things to our heart of how we can discover and better know you. I ask all this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Uh, This passage of scripture is so interesting to me because uh, Paul was traveling. This is 
uh, many, many years after what we call the day of Pentecost. And you may have heard us mention uh, we're Pentecostal is what people might call our denomination. But I'm really kind of uh, wanting us to look past denominational lines. Did you know that God doesn't care if you're Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian? Uh, well, maybe Episcopalian, I don't know. But uh, he doesn't care what your background is. He cares about where your heart is. He cares about are you truly a follower of Jesus Christ? And are you truly the temple of the Holy Spirit? Those are what matters. He's not going to care what membership uh, you've signed up for unless your name is written on the Lamb's Book of Life. And so we look at this story, and there's a man named Apollos who's going towards Corinth, which Paul writes letters to there, the, the book of Corinthians, First and Second Corinthians. And Paul is on his way to Ephesus, which is his letter there, uh, is where we get the book of Ephesians. And he comes across, uh, it actually says they're disciples, and he asks them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And I want you to notice just two quick things. First of all, it's possible to receive the Holy Spirit and be baptized in the Holy Spirit right when you're saved. Did you know, you don't, some people feel like you've got to go to church a, a whole lot of years before you can use your life for God, before God can you know, put you in a position to be used by God. Did y'all know God really doesn't need us to accomplish anything? He allows us to be a part of his plan. He allows us to be vessels of his Holy Spirit. And so y'all, you don't need to come listen to me a hundred times preach to you. Somebody say, praise the Lord to that. Before God can use your life to make a difference in other people. So Paul asks this question and says, did you receive the Holy Spirit? They said, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And I believe this question is still being asked a lot in the church world because we've gotten so divided sometimes across belief systems. Uh, we think the Holy Spirit is maybe different based on the denomination. Can I tell you, God is still God no matter what the sign says on the door. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And so I hope to maybe help us dispel some of the myths, get rid of some of the confusion and just let God be God in our lives and in our hearts. Uh, we're going to talk today. We've spoken about how the, the word Holy Spirit, every time you see God spoken of as the Holy Spirit in Scripture, the word there, both in the Old and New Testament, anytime it speaks about the Spirit of God, it speaks of breath or wind, uh, this, this breath of fresh air, the wind in our sails, if you will. The Holy Spirit is who helps us get through this life. And so he's an important person of the Godhead to understand, just like God the Father, just like God the Son. And it says that through him, through the Holy Spirit, there are gifts that we have access to. Now, can I tell you, I've never seen church people shout like they do when they get free stuff. Can somebody say amen to that? I don't care if you're Christian or non-Christian. I like free stuff. I love going to Sam's Club. Me and Noah, we try to plan our visits to Sam's Club. Anybody else go to Sam's Club around lunchtime? Because they're handing out all the free samples. And what I do is I go through to any of the ones that I don't really care for but Noah likes. I'll go through with him anyway because he can have my free sample. And the ones that, that I like and he doesn't like, he goes through it anyway because we give each other. We get gifts for each other at Sam's. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Spirit at Sam's sometimes. I love free stuff. I love free food. All those things are good. And so all these gifts that God has us, why would we not want everything God has for us? When we talk about these spiritual gifts, let's talk about some that are very familiar. First, the gift that we all are so thankful for, and if, you're, if you've got your handouts and want to fill them out with me today, uh, I like that those of you take notes with you and so you can keep this in your heart. And we also provide free little three-ring binders so you can keep these with you. Those don't cost you anything. I see some of you have them waving at me. You guys get to go to heaven first that brought those with you today. Hallelujah. The first, the first blank I want to fill in is that we get the gift of eternal life. This is a blessed gift. This is something we're so fortunate to have. And everybody gets excited about the gift of eternal life. And we know that we need it. We know that it's something that we can't earn on our own. Because scripture tells us, in the book of Romans, chapter 6, verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Uh, here in Romans it says that the wages, the payment of sin is death. 
But the gift of God, this, this gift of eternal life, it doesn't come from us. And, and I want to, to make just a quick point here. Did you know you can't do anything to earn salvation? We all know that. But did you know you can't even do anything to keep your salvation? It's a gift. Sometimes we get saved and think, well, now, now I'm saved, I've got to do all this. Y'all, you're as saved as you're, as you're ever going to be when you give your life to Jesus Christ. And the enemy sometimes has us so worried about losing our salvation. And, and, and backsliding is a real thing. You can turn your back on God. But understand, God's not out to take it back. He's not some creditor that gives you salvation and eternal life on a loan. Can somebody say amen to that? When he gives you the gift of salvation, you didn't do anything to earn it, and you don't do anything to deserve it ever. You just have to be grateful for it. It's in response to that free gift that we live a life that glorifies God. Because the payment of sin is death, and I'm so thankful that Jesus Christ paid it all when he died on the cross for us. And in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, one of my favorite verses of Scripture says, It is by grace you have been saved. Through faith, and this is not from yourselves or not from works, some translations say. It is the gift of, of God. Again, this, this is one of the gifts of God that everybody likes. Everybody wants eternal life. Everybody wants to live forever in heaven with the Lord. And this is a gift that is helpful. It helps us to be ready to die. But now these next two gifts that we are going to speak about this morning, I believe are gifts that God gives us to help us to live this life. Because how many of you are looking forward to heaven, but you still got to deal with Monday tomorrow? Come on, somebody. Anybody else, sometimes you're just going real good at church on Sunday, and Monday just smacks you in the face spiritually. This is why God gives us help. He gives us hope. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life. And he was talking about this life that we're living and have it to the fullest. We know eternal life is going to be great, but did y'all know through the gift of, of the Holy Spirit, through the spiritual gifts God gives us, we can have a great life right here on this earth too. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it can be fulfilled. It can be abundant. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 says, On one occasion while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you've heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, which today we're going to get to baptize a dear sister uh, in our baptism service. But he said, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So there's more than just this water baptism. There's a, there's a, a second baptism beyond the baptism of salvation. And that is this second gift. He calls it a gift. The gift of the Holy Spirit. That's the second gift I want you to jot down. Is that the Holy Spirit is a gift to us. We understand that Jesus was a great gift. That God sent His only Son into the world so that whoever would believe in Him would not have to perish, but have the gift of eternal life. But we also need to recognize and realize that the Holy Spirit was sent as a gift as well, it's described in Scripture. So why is it some people, some churches, and I'm not trying to be mean, I'm just saying, I want you to see the problem here. We have no problem receiving Jesus for salvation, but many people, it's a strange thing to talk about receiving the Holy Spirit. It's become confusing, and it shouldn't be. He's a gift, just like Christ is a gift. And that brings us to the, the third of God's gifts we're going to address this morning, and that's the topic of spiritual gifts. We want to help you hopefully better understand spiritual gifts because uh, when we talk about spiritual gifts, it even says it in Scripture, that book of Corinthians that we were talking about. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1, the Apostle Paul writes, he says, Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. The way that word uninformed can also translate, some translations say, I don't want you to be ignorant concerning spiritual things. He's not saying we're stupid. He's just saying we're uninformed. Remember what we'd read about the disciples he encountered in Acts chapter 19. They said, we haven't even heard there was a Holy Spirit. Some people, you know, and, and I, I don't think we mean uh, to do this intentionally, but if we're not careful, those of us that have understanding of the Holy Spirit, of the power that is granted us through spiritual gifts, if we're not careful... 
it can get us feeling like maybe we're better than people that don't understand it. Y'all, we're not better than them. We're just more informed. We just found this gift out. And we shouldn't want to try to make a, a, a division over it. We should want to try to share it with everybody. Because can I tell you again, I don't care what denomination you are, what, what uh, church you were raised in, if you're a child of God, you have access to the spiritual gifts of the Holy Spirit if you'll believe in them, if you'll operate in them. And, and the, the enemy wants us to get all bogged down in theology and, and smart talking, and, and we, get where we, we, we think we're so smart that we miss important things that, that the Lord gives us. And so that's why Paul writes this. I don't want you to be uninformed. Uh, even in, in uh, the Bible times, even so close to after the day of Pentecost, people were still facing confusion about this because it was so different. Look in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7, just a few verses down. In the New Living Translation, it says, A spiritual gift is given to each of us so that we can help each other. Now, I really want you to focus with me on this scripture because we have some things that have happened in the church world that were never intended in scripture. How many of you have heard the word clergy used before? I hear that a lot when I do weddings or funerals. They'll talk about, you know, this is, are you a clergyman or a clergy person? And uh, sometimes we use words around the church so much that we think they're from scripture. Did you know the word clergy, it's really not scriptural. It came about not long after the early church kind of had its, its movement and it uh, just was changing the world. The day of Pentecost had happened. People were going out and getting saved and seeing their friends saved. But then stuff started to revert back. We're creatures of habit. Humans are. And in the Old Testament, there was always the priests that people would go to and, and take their animals to be sacrificed. And somebody always did that for them. And after a while, after the excitement started to die down, people got to going back to the same old things. And we invented these terms like clergy. And what, the, what clergy means is, you know, a minister. Literally what it means is a person who reads. A clergy, that's all they mean is one who reads. So if you read, you're a clergy. Uh, and, but again, remember, way back when, there was a time where in the church world, they thought only ministers could read the Bible. And then they had to tell everybody else, you know, how to interpret it. Y'all, if, if you're waiting on a human to interpret the scripture for you, can I tell you, we all need the guiding of the Holy Spirit. That's how cults are formed. That's how people get in a big mess, is when they listen to a human over the Holy Spirit, who is God. You need God to be able to speak to you, to you directly. That's how this is designed to happen. Jesus didn't come to the earth for you to look to somebody else other than Jesus. And so this term clergy, it also came with another term. For those that are not clergy, has everyone ever heard of the word laity or layman? That's what we use a lot of times for church people. We'll call them the laity or the layman, a lay member. And sadly, some people, they think that's all they have to do is just lay around and wait for Jesus to come back. Hallelujah. And I know y'all aren't like that, but there are people that really they think, all I got to do is come listen to this guy talk, maybe put some money in every now and then, and I'm on my way to heaven. Understand what the term follower of Jesus means. Jesus did a whole lot more than just go to the temple and pray. Everywhere he went, he went about doing good, healing all those who were being oppressed by the devil. That's what the scripture says. He would look out and look for those who were having social injustices d done to them, like the woman at the well, the Gentiles. He reached beyond social boundaries and racial bigotry. He reached out to the, the hurting, the lepers, the people that everybody else had given up on. Jesus was there to minister to them. He reached out to the, the tax collectors, people that everybody else hated and, and despised. He reached out to, to people who were doctors, and like Luke, the, the disciple. He, he reached out to lowly fishermen, cussing sailors like the apostle Peter. He reached out to everybody. He was everywhere he went. He was doing God's work. He did a whole lot more than just coming to a church service. He wasn't laity. He was goity. In case you didn't know, I just made that up off the top of my head. So when we talk about these spiritual gifts, look at this scripture. It says a spiritual gift is given to each of us. Did you know you're just as called as I am to be a minister of the gospel? And, and a preacher, really all we're supposed to do in Scripture is equip the saints for ministry. Not equip the saints to come hear my ministry. 
Because y'all, I'm going to leave you shorthanded every time. If all you're doing is trying to follow me, we need to be following Jesus. Can somebody say amen? And so you have a calling. You have special spiritual gifts that are given. And in scriptures, uh, there's the fruit of the Spirit. Then there's the gifts of the Spirit. There's nine gifts of the Spirit listed in one place in scripture. But if you look all throughout the Old Testament, you can account for really... 27 and and maybe even more depending on how you want to look at it and I don't think scripturally personally I don't believe and and I've heard other ministers say this and the more I'm studying the more I agree with it I don't think there is an exhaustive list of spiritual gifts in scripture in fact it's left kind of open-ended because you know what it means it means that God will give us whatever we need whenever we need it come on somebody a spiritual gift, it's kind of like an airbag in your car, okay? You hope you never have to lo- use it, but you're really grateful for it when you get into to an accident and you've got that, that to help save your life. And, and that's what we have, these spiritual gifts that we have access to. You may not even remember it's there sometimes, but when you need it, it can be there in an instant because it's a gift of the Spirit. It's not of you. It's not your talent. It's not your ability. I can tell you personally that I believe in the the empowerment of the Holy Spirit because I've said this before. I remember being so shy and so uh, I had such a difficult time talking to people that I would turn red-faced whenever I talked to people. I didn't like to speak in front of my class at school. I would beg my parents not to have to go into the gas station when you had to pay cash for gas back then. I didn't like to speak to the gas station attendant because they were a stranger and it just made me really, really uncomfortable. Y'all now, because of the Holy Spirit, you can't shut me up. Come on, somebody. Because I love to talk about the Lord. I love to talk about Jesus Christ. And I can tell you that comes from God. Some people will say, well, that's just not my natural inclination. That's just not my personality. We're not supposed to be talking about our personality. We want to be like Jesus. I don't want to be like who I used to be. I want to be like who he called me to be. So these spiritual gifts, this is the best definition I've ever heard of this. And so I borrowed it here and and a couple of blanks here for you to fill out. A spiritual gift is a special supernatural ability that God gives to each of his children. That's what it is. Here's why. It's so that together we can advance his purposes in the world. That's all it is. That takes away all the mystery, all the, ooh, what is a gift of the Holy Spirit? Can I tell you, it doesn't make you kooky, it doesn't make you crazy, it makes you Christ-like to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Jesus did. It says all the time, he was led by the Spirit, he was empowered by the Spirit, as the Spirit moved him, as the Spirit uh, flowed through him. It it describes this time and time again through Jesus. If you want to be like Jesus, you need the Holy Spirit in your life. And it's, it's such a awesome thing. So let's talk about how to better understand this supernatural ability. Again, so we can do what we wanted, what God has called us to do, which is together advance his purposes in the world. Understanding our spiritual gifts, it can be a process. The first step, and there's three that I want to go over with you quickly before we get to our baptism. Number one, you have to discover the gifts God has for you. Discover, discover the gifts God has for me. That's, that's a, a place to start. That's your first step in understanding spiritual gifts. It says in Romans 12, 6, we have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. And I want to show you something in this verse where it says the word grace and it says the word gifts. Remember, we've been talking about the New Testament was written in Greek, the Old Testament in Hebrew. The Greek words there For grace and gifts are the same two words that we use to make a compound word uh, in the church world called charismatic. There's charisma or and and mata uh, gifts is is mata grace is uh, uh, charisma. That you you combine them, you get that word charismatic. People hear charismatic and they think people are swinging from the chandeliers. Charismatics, we, we think of it, a big, a big emotion and real passionate. And y'all, all that's good. Man, I'm, I'm charismatic. If you say someone has charisma, you know, they're just outgoing. They're personal. It's flowing out. Literally what that word means, though, to kind of diffuse some of the confusion, it's grace gifts. That's what charismatic means. It's people that operate in those gifts God has given them. So if you're charismatic, that just means you operate in the gifts God has given you. It really has nothing to do with what kind of songs you sing. 
how loud you shout or how, how fast you can dance. But that's what we sometimes think of. It's simpler than that. It's more powerful, more important than that. It's these gifts God has given us. We've been given different gifts according to the grace God has given each of us. Psalm 139, 13 through 16 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And I want to stop there. Because how many of you believe that God makes all things good? Now, now, I'm going to ask you that again. If you really believe that God makes everything good, because that's what he did even at creation, in the creation uh, story in, in Genesis, it, he'd look at every day after he'd create things, he'd look at it and said, it is what? Good. Why do we have such a hard time believing that we are made in God's image, that God made us, but we think we're too big of a mess or too big of a mistake or have too many faults or failures that God can call us good. Can I tell you, when it says, I praise you that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, your works are wonderful, I know that full well, you are God's handiwork. You're the greatest thing he's ever made. It says we're the epitome of his creation, yet people struggle with that. Uh, that they have, sometimes we will, we will have such a great uh, you know, image of God, but such a low self-esteem, such a low image of ourself. We only see the bad that we've done and not the handiwork of God in our lives. Now, ladies, y'all, just most often, ladies struggle with this even uh, in, in the natural realm. You know, ladies wear makeup and they'll, they'll dye their hair more often than guys do because guys, a lot of times, you know, ladies look in the mirror and it's so funny because I'll, I'll see, like, my wife, she'll think, you know, this just doesn't look good or I need to, to do this out or the other. And I think she's the most beautiful lady in the world and she doesn't seem to see that. Now, I'll see some guys, especially, I'll be working out in the gym and I'll watch these guys, man, they just look like they crawled out of bed and just rolled over, you know, in something dead and they're posing in front of the mirror in the gym, you know, look, looking at themselves. Guys don't have as big an issue with this sometimes. But, but can I tell you, guys, we do have a lot of times issues not so much with how we look, but we get down on ourselves, what we're capable of. We have low self-esteem. We have low respect for ourselves. Whatever it might be, we are all fearfully and wonderfully made because God made us and his works are wonderful. I know that full well. And if we believe that, then we can finally really get to the last part of this verse that says, all the days ordained for me were written in your book before any one of them came to be. All the days of our life, it says God laid out for us. And see if you can relate to this. There are times in our life where you know you're following God. And you, you, can, you just feel it. You know what I'm talking about? You just, everything seems right in the world. Even if things are not going easy, you just feel at peace. Because you know you're in God's will. But how many of you know what it feels like to be out of God's will also? You know, the stress, the worry, just the uncertainty of what am I doing? What am I supposed to do? I believe that God has all of our days ordained, all of our lives laid out, a plan for us to follow, but we have free will to decide if we'll stay on that path or not. And so think about that, that the gifts God has, you need to discover them. And the way that you can help discover them is remember, God created something specific in you. The things that, that cause you great joy, the things that... Maybe break your heart for other people, that you want to help them. Those are gifts that maybe only you have. You know how sometimes you'll feel real passionately about something, but even your good friend, maybe even your spouse, they don't just seem as passionate about it. That may not be their gift, but it's yours. And you shouldn't be frustrated at them because they don't feel as strongly as you do, because we all have different gifts. But you also shouldn't feel... Uh, weird about your gifts. If you're like, why is this so important to me? It's because God put it on your heart. And so these spiritual gifts, you first need to discover them. Then the next step is you need to develop the gifts God has given you. You need to make that personal. I need to develop the gifts God has given me. Uh, again, some of the best advice I've heard when it comes to spiritual gifts I want to share with you is that our gifts change and mature as we change and mature. I look at those graduating from high school, and I can still vaguely remember when I graduated. It, it seems like the years just go by so quickly. 
and I kind of remember, you know, the things that were so important to me then. You know, I wasn't married yet. I, I was worried about where am I going to go to college? Where, uh, where, where am I going to, you know, have a career? What am I going to do with my life? And now at, at 35, I'm still not old, but y'all, I'm not who I was when I was 18, graduating high school. And I would hope that, that you're not either. Have any of y'all ever met those people that just seem like they peaked in high school? That always bums me out for them, man. They're just living, living in the past. Can I tell you, if you still got breath in your lungs, you still got life to live for God. Your best is not behind you. I don't care what your age is. You still have things, that, that gifts that God has given you. They may be different than when you were younger, and that's okay. Your gifts change and mature as you do as well. You see the world differently. You look, look at your life differently, and, and God can use your giftings differently. 1 Corinthians 14.1 says, Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit. This even means desiring gifts that you don't have yet. Did you know, sometimes we'll say, well, that person has a gift of healing, or that person has a gift of faith, or this person has a gift of prophecy, whatever gifting. Like I said, there's, there's 27 or so mentioned in the New Testament, and we like to put that with the person. We'll always remember, those gifts come from who? The Holy Spirit. They don't belong to that person. And if you have the Holy Spirit in you, you have access to that same anointing, that same power, that same gift that that person has. You may just not be in a place in your life that you need it. But when you need it, it'll be there if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, that's why this is so important. And 2 Timothy 1.6 teaches such a powerful truth. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God which is in you. And I want you to notice something about this. The gift of eternal life, we don't do anything to deserve it, nothing to earn it. The gifts of the Spirit, we don't do anything with initially. They're a gift. They're free just like salvation. But all throughout Scripture, there's something different. Once you get saved, you're just saved because of the blood of Jesus. Can somebody say amen for the blood of Jesus Christ? It washes away all of our sins. You don't have to earn. You don't have to scrub those sins off yourself. Jesus does all of that. The gifts of the Spirit, though, are more involved than that. They're different. This is why I think there's confusion here. Because Jesus is the one who gives us the gift of salvation. God gives us the gifts of the Spirit, but we have to walk in them and operate in them and and allow them. It says that the Spirit is subject to the prophet or the person using those gifts. That's why here there's scriptures all like this that say like fan into flame. There's described stuff that we do. Again, we're not the one who got the, the started the spark or got the coal going that was the fire of God in our life. But how many of you know sometimes you don't feel like serving God, but you know you need to serve Him anyway. Sometimes you don't feel encouraged in the Lord and you just need to turn on some worship music or you need to just get alone with God and, and get in a place in His presence where that, that fire just kind of comes back. You know God's there. It's it's not that you don't believe in God. It's just you've been kind of worn down. You've become weary by, by life. The Bible says don't become weary in well-doing. Just keep that flame alive. Keep that fire alive. It's just like in a relationship with one another. In, in your marriage, there's sometimes things you have to do to show your spouse that I still love you. I, I know that we've been married a long time, but the fire's still there. It just maybe it isn't burning as brightly right now as it should be. And you've got to rekindle that fire. It's the same thing in our relationship with God. And so, knowing that we have gifts to discover, that are, they're for you, they're, they're in your life, and then that you need to develop them, that brings us to the third and final step that many people never really get to. And that is you need to use the gifts God has given you. And if you're not in a place in your life where you can honestly say, and, and really if you can't say it off the top of your head, how that God is using your life to make a difference. If you can't think of that, you're like, I don't really know what my life does. Can I tell you, that's why I believe we live in the most blessed nation in the world. The United States of America is the greatest nation on the face of the earth. We are the most prosperous. Even our poverty line people are considered wealthy to 99% of the rest of the world. We are so blessed, yet we are also the highest suicide rate in the world. It's because you can have all the blessings, you can have all the stuff that you can get in life, but if you don't have a purpose, life can feel meaningless and fruitless. 
If you don't know what your life is for, you'll just go through the motions. Have any of you just not wanted to get up and get out of bed? Y'all, depression is a real thing. But can I tell you, it is not from God and it is not of God. God put a calling on your life. The enemy wants you to end your life. And I've been hearing several people this week that are struggling, dealing with the spirit of suicide, dealing with the spirit of just giving up. And y'all, that is not the spirit of God. And can I tell you why a lot of people deal with that and they feel like their life is useless is because they are not using their life. They're not using the gifts God has given them so they feel like they have no purpose. They're listening to the lie of the enemy instead of discovering and developing the life that God has given them. Don't listen to the lies of the devil. Live that life that Jesus died for you to have. Amen. He would not give his life for you for your life to be worthless and meaningless. Somebody needs to say amen to that. So finally, if if the worship team would come up and they're going to lead us in that final song again about the spirit of the living God as we get ready uh, for baptism. And uh, Peyton, if you want to go ahead and be getting ready at this time, I want you to know that, that our church exists for a simple reason. we got a simple plan, a simple purpose here. We want people to get to the point that they're doing this, that they use the gifts God has given them. Because y'all, the church is about more than a preacher or or a pastoral team or a worship team or grow group leaders, small group leaders, whatever. Every single person in the body of Christ, listen to this, is just as important as every other person. We like to put people up a little bit higher. I, I stand up here and stand here in this fancy suit. Can I tell you? I'm a child of God, but so are you. And you have just as much purpose, you have just as much meaning to your life as I do or anybody else does. And you need to walk in that victory. Never hold your head down. Never feel like anybody's better than you. Because can I tell you what, if you have Jesus Christ in you, you've got access to the best there is, the best there was, and the best there ever will be. You house the, the greatest being. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are precious in the, in the eyes of God. So precious that Jesus died for your very life. And so we've got a a, a specific plan here. You'll see it on banners. You'll see it on our worship guides. Four simple phrases that I hope you'll remember. I I hope you hear it so much you kind of get tired of it just because that's when people really start to get things is when they hear it so much. It's commonplace to them. We want to make sure everybody, everybody in the world is what our desire is, knows God. And I put this in your notes today that, that we want you to know God And know that you're saved. Know that you have that gift of eternal life. We also want you to find freedom. There may be some of you in here today that you're bound. Uh, Yes, you're saved. But just like uh, high school graduates, at graduation, even though you've got 12 years of of knowledge and, and, and learning from high school on down, how many of you, when you graduated, you still weren't really sure what to do with your life? You've still got stuff growing to do and stuff you've got to figure out, fears and things to face. Many of us, when we get saved, we still are battling temptations. We're battling old habits. That's why I'm so thankful for ministries like Celebrate Recovery and and things we're developing uh, this fall. We're going to have a a course called Freedom that I pray every single church member will go through. Because even if, if you found freedom from your life, you may not know how best to help other people get the deliverance they need through through God. We don't want you just to know God and not no, no real freedom in life. So we want you to find freedom. It's only when you've done that that you can take that next step and really discover your purpose. See, if you're still bound, if you're still blinded by your old sins, you still think of yourself as that broken down, messed up person, you're not going to understand what you're capable of. You're not going to understand the potential you have. And once you get to that step where you discover your purpose, This is what growth track really helps. You hear us talking about growth track. It's more than just a class. We take a spiritual giftings test. We take a personality test. All designed to help you see you don't need to be somebody else. You just need to be who God's called you to be. And y'all, we need you. The, The body of Christ needs you. You know why there's so many lost people out in this world, even though we got so many churches? It's because there's very few people in those churches, percentage-wise, actually ministering day in, day out. They leave it up to the clergy, the, those that read. 
whoop de doo We need less laity and more goity. Going into all the world, preaching the gospel. Everywhere you go, when you step in the workplace, you're a minister of the gospel. In your family, y'all, we should be ministering to our family first. And sometimes that's the place that we forget about it the most. Discover that purpose God has for you so that you can use your life to make a difference. And as we get ready to, to baptize this young lady, I'm, I'm so excited about those that make a decision for Christ. Because the Bible says whenever we're in Christ, we're a new creation. The old is gone. The new has come. And you need to quit thinking, I was created to be a sinner. That's a lie. People think, well, I'm just going to keep sinning because I've always sinned. Where does God say that in his word? That's human fear. That's, that's, human, that, that's us thinking we're, we're only uh, capable of what humans are capable of. Y'all, through the blood of Jesus Christ, all of our sins are washed clean. Does anybody believe that? There's none left. There is no sin that the blood of Jesus cannot cover. I don't care what you did 50 years ago or 5 minutes ago. The blood of Jesus is strong enough and powerful enough to wipe away every blemish, every spot. So quit thinking you're badder than Jesus is good. Jesus is gooder than you are badder. Amen. So once you get that straight, then understand Well, I don't have any gifts. I don't have any abilities. What can I do with my life? You can't do nothing, but God can do great things. And these gifts come from the Holy Spirit. You want God to use your life? Get to know Him. Know the Holy Spirit. Seek Him. Discover those gifts that He has for you. It said that in Scripture. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. And they're given so we can help one another. Again, the reason this world is so broken, hear this last thing. The reason this world is so broken is not because God is not able to fix it. Does anybody believe that God is big enough to fix whatever mess this world is in? It's not because of that. It's because we're too fearful to believe he can do it through us. Again, we're trying to be laity spiritually to God. God wants to use us. He will use us. He gives us his gifts for a reason. I want to ask you if you would to stand all over this place. The last thing I want you to remember is that you know God, you find freedom, you discover purpose, and you make a difference until you're able to say this last phrase, I was made for this. So many people, they think I I was just made to make mistakes. I'll see people, I just did a a wedding yesterday for a precious couple. Both of them went through difficult marriages. I got to meet with them before the wedding and they were telling me about, you know, some of the heartache that they went through. And can I tell you, uh, people that go through divorce, it's such a painful thing. Some of y'all in here may have experienced it. And we we will base our current value on our past hurts and our past heartaches. Things that people have said about us or that have done to us, we just carry those on and we think that that's just who we are. We're we're made, we're we're just going to make those same mistakes. Again, that's a lie from the father of lies. It says anyone that's in Christ, if you receive that eternal gift of salvation, you got to receive that other part that says anybody that's in Christ is a new creation. The old is gone. The new, you're not who you used to be anymore. Not because you feel like it. Not because you felt goosebumps. Because Jesus said so. He said, it is finished. I took care of it all, Jesus said. I want to ask you to bow your heads, bow your hearts all over this place. And if you have been struggling in your, in, in your heart to believe this truth. If you've been, you've been dealing with, you know, really knowing God. You just, you've been so caught up in, in how bad you've been. You haven't really been able to just give your life to the Lord fully. Your first step may just be to to say, God, I just need you. I need to know that you really do forgive me of everything. I need to know you're not out to get me, but you're out to get me free. To help me find a purpose and to make a difference with my life. If that's you and you want to commit your life to the Lord this morning, would you raise your hand just right where you're at? I believe there's several of you. Yeah, anybody else? Praise God. Anyone else? I'm just going to give you a second. I want to pray with you. Don't be embarrassed. Anyone else quickly? Hallelujah. Thank you for for your boldness. I want to pray over you. And we're about to baptize this sister who's given her life to the Lord. 
And I want all of us to just be so passionate and desperate to see our life used the way God wants it to be used. Can we pray that way? Heavenly Father, Lord, for these that acknowledge this morning that they need you, I pray that you would help them believe in you right now not to believe in themselves anymore, to believe that they have to earn salvation. We accept that free gift. We confess that we are sinners, that, uh, that we need your salvation. We turn away from that old life. And we want to walk and know you and live in that true life that you created for us. We want to write a new story. Our life might have been going the wrong path, but it says you ordained things. You wrote in your book our life before we were even born. And we want to follow that plan you had, God. Get us back on the right path. And help us trust it's by you that we're on that path. And you can keep us going further and and stronger and better than ever. And Lord, I pray we would desire the Holy Spirit in our lives. I pray we would desire your spiritual gifts. Teach us about them from your word. But Lord, we don't just want to know about it. We want to live it. We want to experience you for real. I ask this all in the precious name of Jesus Christ. And all in agreement said... Amen. Will somebody give God praise for those that committed their hearts to the Lord today? Hannah, would y'all lead them in this song one more time? Y'all can be seated. If you'll just hang around for a minute, we're going to baptize Peyton, and then Pastor Mark will come and dismiss us with prayer, and we'll have a time of food and fellowship. But let's worship together for just a moment.